Okay, Daniel, let's go ahead and get started. I'm ready when you are. Hey everybody, Dr. Wohler here for Great Plains Lab. I'm from Integrated Medicine Academy and I wanna thank Great Plains for the continued sponsorship of these three webinars they do every month. Um, I've been doing these webinars for many, many years now. And so what I thought I would talk about in this lecture is a general overview of the organic acid test uh, with regards to functional medicine. And I'll, and I'll kind of define what I mean by that as we go through. I've done a lot of topics, a lot of lectures on organic acid testing in general. And I thought we would do maybe a little bit different angle on this particular lecture. I'll tell you what I mean by that here shortly by focusing on one particular area of the oat and what it could mean clinically, either for yourself or for patients if you're a practitioner listening. Now, I've been an integrative and functional medicine physician for over two decades. I've done a lot of clinical education for Great Plains Laboratory. I've spoken throughout the United States as well as internationally. I'm a practicing clinician. I'm also co-founder of something called Integrative Medicine Academy, which is an online training academy with courses in integrative medicine. And I'll, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. I'm also medical director of something called Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, which is a membership site for healthcare practitioners who want to interact with us directly on lab testing reviews, case analysis, et cetera. And in my own practice, I work a lot with the autism community, patients with autoimmune, neurological disorders, et cetera. And Dr. Willer, they're asking you to uh, speak up a little more. Oh, my You're having trouble hearing. My, yeah, it's my microphone. Let me just back out real quick. This thing always does that. Okay, we should be good now. How's that sound, Daniel? Yes, that sounds louder. Okay. Okay, so, so real quickly, I, I've been an integrative medicine. Uh, and reshare your slides. Sorry? And just reshare your slides, please. Oh, oh, oh. We good? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna move, move on from there. So what I thought I would do is we're gonna focus on one area of the organic acid test. And, and it's a specific marker called gluteric and it's found under the nutritional marker section of the organic acid test. And it's actually linked to riboflavin, vitamin B2. But I'll come back to that here shortly. Now I've done a lot of education, perhaps some of you listening have heard me or, you know, when we were in person through the GPL Academy doing the organic acid test seminar, uh, which is all about the fundamental use of the organic acid test in practice. But at the core of what we do is functional medicine. And in, in the early days, you know, functional medicine was really defined around trying to understand the functional relationships between detoxification, digestion, hormone, and immune function. And that still holds true. But, you know, my feeling is this definition has definitely broadened, you know, in looking at other aspects of uh, nervous system, in-depth biochemistry, et cetera. And of course, a fundamental aspect of what we do is functional or also what's called sometimes integrative medicine practitioners is understanding how lifestyle, diet, nutrition, environmental factors can impact on our health. And the chronic stress response is something that is often discussed in the world of functional medicine because it can contribute to a whole host of underlying problems from yeast issues to 
fatigue to headaches to autoimmune problems, digestive problems, depression, can all funnel back to dysregulation through the hypothalamus that communicates with the adrenals in their output of cortisol and the regulation of DHEA and how all of that can influence things at the hormonal level, musculoskeletal, neurological level, and immune system. And what we have in this box are just different stressors that can trigger stress through the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. If we think of fatigue, fatigue is one of those things that we commonly see in our practice. It's very prevalent, but you know, we have to use our clinical skills to come down and say, well, is this secondary fatigue? Is, I mean, is, it, is it being caused by some other underlying medical disorder? Is it perhaps somewhat normal? Okay, physiological fatigue sometimes can happen just because of sleep problems or even too much exercise. It's not really occurring from a medical condition. It's more of a lifestyle type of issue. And it's often relieved with rest. And then chronic fatigue has its own set of criteria, not relieved by rest, not relieved by sleep, and lasting longer than six months. So there is a huge list of things that can contribute or cause fatigue. And so we have to look sometimes very deeply at these, at these issues from a medical standpoint, biological standpoint, biochemical standpoint. Okay, it's not always just, hey, you need to go get better sleep or you know, here's a medication. If we think about the functional approach to digestive system issues, this is where functional medicine to me really shines. In that if you take a condition like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, a lot of times in conventional medicine, what they'll do is they'll say, well, here's an antibiotic and then that's it. That's all you gotta do. Do the antibiotic and let's see if you get it better. They'll do that many times for irritable bowel syndrome as well. But we know that SIBO or irritable bowel is a much more complicated problem than just taking antibiotic for it because it actually involves the understanding of digestion from the mouth all the way into the large intestine, how we eliminate, how we digest, how we break our food down, how we absorb, how the liver is connected to the pancreas, is connected to the small intestine, is connected to the large intestine, and having an understanding of this from a functional standpoint, if we can understand how it's supposed to function, we can oftentimes get better results with our patients. So functional medicine isn't just, oh, take a botanical instead of an antibiotic. Okay, or, you know, here's a handful of supplements you know, that's all you need to do. It is a well thought out, in depth assessment of underlying health issues that requires understanding symptom survey analysis, doing a clinical intake, a physical exam, incorporates sophisticated laboratory testing, definitely critical thinking skills. And the tenacity for some people with chronic health problems to start digging deeper. And that does involve looking at certain aspects of biochemistry, going back to our basic understanding of human physiology and these types of things um, that many of us learned many, many years ago, whether it was undergraduate programs or in medical school. Now the organic acid test to me is a gateway into assessing things from a metabolic standpoint that gives tremendous value. It's really more than just a test. This is a profile. You can almost think of the organic acid test as being a, a, a number of different tests. Each section is its own test. And it's a game changer in practice when you become more proficient at using the information from this test. But it's an onion effect, right? It, it, there's many layers to understanding how to interpret and how to implement the information that the organic acid test provides. 
<clears throat> so before I get started, let's just redefine what organic acids are. Now, organic acids are chemical compounds that are excreted in the urine of mammals that are products of our metabolism. So they're much more concentrated in the urine than let's say in the bloodstream. So that's why you can do urine organic acid test and get the reflection of organic acid levels in the body. Now, lactic acid is an organic acid that we naturally produce. And there could be many reasons why it's elevated. It could be anything from hypovolemic shock to a thiamine deficiency, to alcohol intoxication, to various things metabolically. All of these organic acids contain carbon and hydrogen, but some of them may contain nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, for example. So lactic acid, as I mentioned before, is a natural organic acid that we produced and elevated levels can mean various things. So you have to start digging and looking at what are some things that could cause elevated lactic acid. At its root, it's actually um, metabolically connected to glucose metabolism. So that's why under the organic acid test from Great Plains, you'll see it listed under the glycolytic cycle metabolites because it's linked to glycolysis or glucose metabolism. Now, there are organic acids that are produced by organisms that live in our gut. So bacteria, clostridia, fungal organisms, yeast, candida, and then if we're exposed to certain types of mold, like aspergillus mold, they can colonize the gut and we can get a production of organic acids as a reflection of the existence of these organisms in the gut. So the organic acid test gives us an idea of what is going on in our digestive system as well as what's going on in the rest of our body. And if you look at a typical organic acid test in somebody who has a lot of markers, this is page one of an individual who actually has mold exposure, we can see a number of organic acids that are reflective of that mold. Okay, so marker two, marker four, for example, marker six as well. And then we can see organic acids that are reflective of other types of fungus, like arabinose linked to candida or tricarboxylic, which is an organic acid reflective of fusarium mold exposure. There's many bacterial markers that can show up. So these are all reflective of what's happening on the gut, but these are all organic acids themselves. Oxalates play a huge role in creating pain in the body, arthritic pain, skeletal pain, connective tissue problems, contribute or long-term to things like kidney stones as well. Here we can see lactic acid being elevated. The test doesn't tell me why the lactic acid is high, but it gives me, uh, there's other things that we can learn off the organic acid test that could perhaps explain why it's high. But we have to also look at our clinical history of the patient and look at all the variables that could lead to, let's say, just an elevation of lactic acid. For example, lactic acid is commonly elevated with people with mold exposure. Succinic acid is commonly elevated in people with chemical exposure, but it is possible that succinic could be elevated for the same reasons that the lactic acid is from, and that would be some type of mold problem, which was exactly what was happening in this individual. Looking at the Great Plains mycotox profile, we can see a number of mycotoxins that are elevated, okra toxin, gliotoxin, mycophenolic, and zeolianon. And these mycotoxins are, they're separate from the mold. These mycotoxins are their own chemical entity. They can stay in the body for years. The mold could be long gone. The markers on page one of the oat could be totally normal for mold, but somebody could still be harboring these mycotoxins. So you can't use the oat as a sole determining factor of mold exposure. If the mold markers show up, that's great. You know that there's colonization happening in the gut, 
but it doesn't tell you what mycotoxins are present. You have to do the mycotoxin test as well. And then we've got markers that look at oxidative stress. So under the indicators of detoxification section, we've got this marker called pyroglutamic. It has an asterisk next to it. And when the asterisk, what that means is that this marker is indirect, meaning that when the pyroglutamic is elevated, there's a deficiency of glutathione. Glutathione, that important cellular antioxidant, also important in a liver as well for detoxification. Well, this person has a number of reasons why their glutathione might be deficient, particularly all of the mold, all of the mycotoxins, all, all of the fungal organisms could be enough to just deplete glutathione. The mitochondria are an area in the body that is often dysfunctional in people with chronic digestive problems, autoimmune issues, neurological problems, fatigue, mold exposure. We see them often uh, mitochondrial issues in autism, for example. And if we just think of the basic function of the mitochondria, what we're ultimately looking to do is produce ATP, the, the adenosine triphosphate, that energy currency chemical that all of our body needs to run. Our nervous system, our cardiovascular system, our digestive system, our immune system, et cetera. And so through the breakdown of proteins, carbs, and fats, we can generate this energy through a very complex network of different biochemical reactions. And things can get blocked and, and things are deficient along the way that could compromise mitochondrial activity. We can also bombard the mitochondria with toxins, chemical toxins, metals, mycotoxins, but nutritional deficiencies can compromise it as well. And then there are various genetic disorders which can block certain steps along the way that would compromise the ability to make ATP. And it gets very complicated, but it's also very interesting when you want to take a deeper dive into this type of information, which to me, the organic acid test as just a profile and learning how to use it provides. It demands, in my experience, um, the necessity at some point to dig deeper. It challenges us as practitioners to constantly keep seeking information, keep asking questions, because there's always another level that we can go to. We know that the mitochondria themselves are highly complex. We know that they're also very vulnerable to oxidative stress. Just the normal process of cellular respiration will, will generate what are called free radicals. And I'll talk about that here shortly that can have a damaging effect on cell structures, cell membranes, proteins, organelles, et cetera. And so even through the normal process of mitochondrial activity for the ultimate production of ATP, there is going to be oxidative stress generated. And this is why for, for all of us, including our patients, a healthy lifestyle, adequate sleep, diet, exercise, good supplementation will help to combat some of the damaging effects of dysfunction that occurs at the cellular level. Ultimately, what's happening at the mitochondrial level, particularly in the electron transport chain, is we're moving electrons from one complex to the next, okay? That causes a electrical gradient effect that is pumping out hydrogen, or basically a proton, a, a plus charge, to eventually downstream at complex five, what's called the AT, ATP synthase complex, to create a hydrogen, uh, a hydrogen gradient effect concentration where it flows back into the matrix of the cell and engages the mechanism to make ATP. Anything that blocks 
this chemical sequence can compromise ATP. Now there's genetic factors that could do it. There's lack of antioxidants that could do it. Deficiencies of CoQ10 could compromise it. Deficiencies of niacin could compromise it. And there's other nutrients involved here as well. FAD to FADH is actually linked to vitamin B2. So there's always or usually more than one reason that some of these markers are out of balance. And it becomes our job as practitioners to try to figure out what are the things that could be contributing to even just in this section of the test linked to mitochondrial issues. So let's come back and talk about one aspect off the organic acid test under the nutritional marker section called a marker called gluteric. Now notice gluteric falls in the category of an indirect marker, which means it has it if there's an asterisk next to it, which means if gluteric is high, we have a deficiency of riboflavin. You'll notice here we've got methylmalonic has an asterisk marker. So an increase of methylmalonic in, indicates a decrease or deficiency of B12. An increase of 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaric indicates a decrease of CoQ10. What we'll commonly see on organic acid tests is elevations of glutaric. So a high glutaric indicates a riboflavin deficiency. The question is, is why? Why is that happening? And also what else might it be affecting that we could think about clinically with our patients when we do an organic acid test? Let's look at riboflavin a little bit deeper. So a lot, of, some of this information actually comes from a course that I have through Integrated Medicine Academy called Advanced Oat Mastery Course. This is a course where we go through every single marker on the oat test in a very in-depth way. So if anybody is listening to this who's part of that course, a few of these slides may look familiar to you. This is coming from one particular, a section of one particular lecture. So riboflavin is found in many food sources, meats, almonds, milk, and other dairy products, certain vegetables, eggs, some countries actually require that it's added to grain products. Now, it was first discovered in 1920. I think it was isolated probably a decade later. And it's been used to treat riboflavin deficiency. And it's now on the list from the World Health Organization as an essential medicine. Now, in developing countries, and particularly in refugee situations or communities that are under extreme stress um, from an environmental standpoint, where you know that there is a lack of nutrients, people can end up getting deficiencies in riboflavin. And there's a number of different associated conditions that can be associated with that. Now, some of these you may see in your practice um, if you're doing physical exams and just to, just to kind of keep a lookout for. A riboflavinosis is another name for riboflavin deficiency. Glossitis is a, is a redness and swelling of the tongue. Chelosis is inflammation that occurs on the lips, also at the angles of the mouth. That's also sometimes called angular stomatitis. People can develop itching and burning eyes from a riboflavin deficiency. Stomatitis, as I mentioned, is an inflammation of the lips and mouth. And sometimes you can get oral lesions that look like these aphthous uh, ulcerations, for example. These aren't always linked to a B, uh, B2 deficiency. There can be some other conditions that can lead to that. But if you just take all of this in, in context, as you examine patients, you know, think about how some of this might manifest for some people. People can also develop this, these types of rashes that can affect the face, particularly around the nose and the nasal labial folds. 
And then there's other issues that would get picked up like on a blood test, something called normochromic normocytic anemia, where, you, where you're, you're anemic, but you have normal cell size of the red blood cell and normal hemoglobin. So your, your, your hemoglobin levels are normal and the red blood cells are normal in size as opposed to let's say B12 deficiency where you get what's called megaloblastic anemia with a cell size very large. In severe cases, heart problems, limb deformities. This is actually a concern in uh, animals. So um, livestock, for example, chickens, this is just a couple examples of riboflavin deficient chicks. And then very severe, severe problems can lead to liver and nervous system degeneration. Now riboflavin and the chemistry of it is fairly complex. So we know it's a cofactor in many biochemical reactions, okay, that are involved in what's called cellular respiration, okay, that's basically meaning what's going on at the mitochondrial level. It's part of an enzyme cofactor of something called flavin adenine dinucleotide and flavin mononucleotide. And all these, these are the chemical structures down below. So riboflavin gets converted to these different forms. So first riboflavin gets converted by riboflavin kinase to the flavin mononucleotide and then eventually to the flavin adenine dinucleotide form. Now notice that it requires ATP. So we actually need ATP from our mitochondria in order to make these conversions. And this occurs by the way with other vitamins like converting panathenic acid to coenzyme A actually requires ATP. So that there's a metabolic demand that's needed to get these vitamins into a form that is utilizable by the body. So, Again, you don't have to necessarily remember all aspects of the chemistry here, but what's interesting to note is that the role of these cofactors and what's happening at a biological level is through what's called um, reduction or, or reduction equivalence or the oxidative reduction type of reactions. And what that means is that these, these nutrients play a role in the conversion of different substances moving through its different biochemical steps so that it can be utilized in a energy formation way, for example, carbs, proteins, fats, eventually getting taken down to the level where they can be used to make ATP. So I wanna go through some related biochemistry linked to riboflavin. And I want you just to think about either yourself, maybe if you've, if you've done O testing on yourself, or if you're a practitioner thinking about some patients, or if you've done O testing, you're kind of looking at different relationships on the O. We're not going to go through everything here, but I want you to see how some of these, these areas connect. Riboflavin actually has a relationship to the formation of active B6. Okay, so that's kind of interesting, right? So B2 has a relationship to B6. Riboflavin is important in what's called fatty acid oxidation. Just the bottom line there is taking fatty acids and converting them down to where they can be used as a fuel source at the mitochondrial level to make ATP. First, let's, st let's start with acetaldehyde. What is acetaldehyde and where does it come from? Well, one of the things where acetaldehyde can come from is alcohol consumption. It can also be produced by yeast. Yeast and the metabolism of yeast will take glucose and it'll create ethanol as an end product. But in the step prior to that, it can produce acetaldehyde. And acetaldehyde needs to be converted. There's many cofactors that are involved in its conversion, including riboflavin. So if we have a riboflavin deficiency, 
It's not to say in total, but it could contribute to an elevation of glutaric acid on the oat test because it's needed by the enzyme that converts acetaldehyde to acetic acid. We do not want acetaldehyde hanging around. Many aldehydes, these chemicals that contain a carbon, a double bonded oxygen and a hydrogen, that's an aldehyde, are stressful metabolically in our body. They can trigger DNA damage. They can damage proteins. They can damage mitochondria, lipid peroxidation. They can deplete glutathione. This is a big problem in um, alcoholism, for example, where people start destroying the lining of their gut, their liver gets you know, dysfunctional and it can lead to a lot of oxidative stress. Okay, and we hear that word a lot, oxidative stress. And oxidative stress really has to do with the fact that we've got in, you know, instability at the molecular level. And there's many different types of free radicals essentially that can damage our tissues. So for example, here's a, here's a free radical that it's, its outer shell of electrons is unstable. It's in this particular case, it wants to have eight electrons in its outer shell for it to be a stable molecule, but it's missing one. So it's gonna seek some other type of chemical in the body to neutralize or, or stabilize itself. If it's our DNA, it's gonna grab an electron from our DNA to create a stable molecule. But in the process, our DNA is gonna get damaged. <clears throat> well, just think of any tissue structure in the body. It could be a cell membrane, it could be mitochondria, it could be a protein. Okay, this happens all throughout the body. And one of the roles of antioxidants is the antioxidant plays the role of donating an electron to a free radical to stabilize it, right? Because it doesn't have that that eight electron, what's called an octet in its, in its outer valence shell. And so it's gonna be seeking an electron from something else. But if you take an antioxidant, the antioxidant is just gonna donate an electron, make this free radical happy. And so it's no longer damaging to other tissues. Let's look at another relationship with regards to riboflavin. And that is a, something called the oxidation of pyruvate, alpha ketoglutarate, and branch chain amino acid hydroxylases. Well, to really start the story, we have to go back to glycolysis, which is the conversion of glucose to pyruvic acid. Once we're at the position of pyruvic acid, Okay, we need to convert pyruvic acid to a chemical called acetyl coenzyme A, because it's the acetyl coenzyme A that is, at least in part, the gateway into the Krebs cycle. So if we can't make that happen, we're not going to be able to get adequate production of ATP. So one of the things I discuss in uh, the courses that I do when we're talking about mitochondrial activity, or you're just talking about protein, carbohydrate, fat metabolism, is that all roads lead to the mitochondria, or at least most roads do metabolically. Proteins, their primary function actually is to create um, the amino acids and the protein that we, that we eat and, and or our body generates is really meant to maintain tissue structure. It's not really to make energy. We get plenty of energy from fats and carbs. We want protein around so that we can create our collagen, the keratin, the uh, immunoglobulins, the things that maintain our vasculature, the things that maintain the integrity of our body. And then from a secondary standpoint, we could use proteins for a fuel source. So, we have just gone from glucose to pyruvate or what's called pyruvic. Another term is pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid, 
when it loses its hydrogen, okay? So when it's got the hydrogen attached, it's the acid. When it when it's and the it's because it's the it's the hydrogen that is having the acidic effect essentially when it when it gets dispersed. And so when it loses the hydrogen, it becomes what's called an anion, or what's called also a base. And so we go from pyruvic acid to a pyruvate. Now the actual chemical structure of pyruvic acid, if you go back real quick, as you can see down here, is we've got a double bonded oxygen, two double bonded oxygens actually, with a hydroxyl group on one end and a methyl group on the other. Let me show you what happens to it. So step one is we're removing essentially this carboxyl group. It gets released from the pyruvate molecule or chemical. And it ultimately gets converted into CO2. So basically we're removing carbon dioxide from this chemical. This particular chemical gets oxidized. What does that mean? Well, it means it's losing an electron. Okay, so in, in, when, a, when a chemical gets oxidized, it's losing an electron. And we've got nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide sitting down here. By the way, NAD is produced via actions of niacin. So we need vitamin B3 in order to make nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And actually we need vitamin riboflavin to actually help with that too. So our NAD, okay, accepts the electron and in the process, it becomes reduced and it gets reduced to NADH. You could think of NADH as sort of the active form, although both forms are active in this particular chemical process. So we move from a, uh, an oxidized form of NADH to a reduced form of NADH. And in the process, we create CO2 and we take that coenzyme component and we attach it to the acetyl group. So basically this acetyl group gets attached to this coenzyme complex to become acetyl coenzyme A. That coenzyme part right there gets produced by actions of B5 or panathenic acid. And you'll hear about this a lot. And this is one of the things that I've even used in my own terminology in lecturing or with patients. And you hear it a lot in, in just various literature, you know, oh, it's an oxidation reaction. It's, it's causing free radicals. People go, what is that? What does that mean? What does that look like visually? Well, from a chemical standpoint, right? When, we, when, we, when a compound or uh, an atom, for example, loses an electron, Okay, it becomes oxidized in the process. So if something is donating an electron to something else, it's considered to be a reducing agent. So basically the bottom line here is that a chemical compound that's taking on an electron gets reduced. Okay, a re reduction is the gain of an electron. It becomes more stable. And that's one of the things that's happening in so many regards with regards to chemical exchanges in the body is it's moving through what's called this oxidation reduction type reaction. In fact, the first phase of liver detoxification, phase one, is very much of an oxidation reduction type of reaction. And it gets more complicated from, than that because as you start to break down what are called more lipid soluble chemicals, for example, you're trying to transform their chemical configurations and their chemical nature into a more water soluble form so they can be more easily dumped out of the body. So that's kind of the process of phase one to phase two liver detox. 
But that's it, really, from a fundamental level. If we just sort of keep that that vision in mind, when you hear these words, you can kind of see, you know, when you hear this oxidation reduction, it's just a transferring of electrons from one chemical group to the next to help propel conversion of different chemicals in their different stages. So if we think of pyruvate dehydrogenase, here is our pyruvic acid chemical, right? We're taking off, this is called a carboxyl group. We're removing this carboxyl group through an oxidative reduction type reaction. It releases CO2 and what we have left over is this group right here. And this is an acetyl group that complexes with the coenzyme A that comes from our panathenic acid and it becomes acetyl coenzyme A. And as you can see, this complex to make to just convert pyruvic acid to acetyl coenzyme A requires a lot of stuff. It requires nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide which has a link back to niacin. It requires riboflavin in the form of FAD. It requires lipoic acid. It requires thiamine, B1. It requires actions of B5. So there's a lot of nutrients here that affect just this one enzyme to make acetyl coenzyme A so that acetyl coenzyme A acts as the entry point into our Krebs cycle, into our mitochondria. What's interesting about this enzyme complex is that it's also found in other areas metabolically. So here is pyruvate dehydrogenase, okay, to form acetyl coenzyme A as that entry point into our Krebs cycle. It also is involved in what's called alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, another step in Krebs cycle formation that same enzyme complex exists there, okay? Because we need to keep marching along these different steps to keep things moving in a forward direction. But it's even found in other places. Because remember when I mentioned about metabolism of proteins, fats, carbs, okay? All roads lead to the mitochondria, well, in order to properly break down many amino acids, we have an enzyme complex called the branch chain, um, uh, uh, branch chain amino acid dehydrogenase is what it's called, or it's, it's various forms, but essentially that same complex of nutrients is needed. Thiamine, lipoic acid, coenzyme A, FAD. So you could sit here and go, that, that's B1, Coenzyme is B5, it's linked to B5. Fl uh, flavin adenine dinucleotide is linked to B2. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is linked to B3. All right, look at all those B vitamins. Throw a little bit of magnesium in there, throw a little bit of lipoic acid in there and you're good to go. Okay, so that is one of the connections of riboflavin. This was kind of a surprise to me actually when I learned about riboflavin's influence on the methylation cycle. Turns out that FAD, so the riboflavin FAD connection is a cofactor of methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. So we've all heard of MTHFR, right? It gets a lot of press, a lot of focus, a lot of attention. And it's taking I don't like calling it an inactive folate. It's, it's still an active folate, but it's taking a form of folate. It's called 510-methylene tetrahydrofolate. And it's converting it to 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. People oftentimes think of the 5-methyl form, the active form. Well, it is true. It is active and it's because it's the form that methylates cobalamin within our methionine synthase enzyme. So it is very important 
with regards to engaging things at the methylation level, right? To be able to convert homocysteine to methionine, we need actions of the methionine synthase. So if we don't have enough folate in the 5 methyl form, we can't really methylate adequately. Well, it turns out we need riboflavin in order to activate that enzyme. What's interesting, it is even goes further than that. Not only is MTHFR somewhat dependent on riboflavin, but so is the methionine synthase enzyme. Okay, so in order uh, to engage methionine synthase in its various forms, we need B2 as well. So this is, again, this is looking at these systems from a deeper level and asking the questions when you see something off an organic acid test, why is this high and what other things might it be affecting? Well, we talked about glutathione just briefly with regards to pyroglutamic. Notice you'll hear the terminology oxidized glutathione and reduced glutathione. Reduced is the active form, right? That's the form that's going to have the ability to act as an antioxidant. What is it doing when it works as an antioxidant? Well, in part, what it's helping to do is to donate um, one of its, you know, it's a, an electron to create a more stable molecule on the other side. Glutathione is very important in helping to convert toxic chemicals to less toxic compounds. So it plays a huge role in liver, particularly with regards to phase two liver detoxification. Glutathione is also really important in other cells of the body like the nervous system and the brain and nervous system are neurons because it's there to help protect against excess buildup of certain chemicals within the cytoplasmic, or excuse me, cytosolic fluid of the cell like dopamine, or also helps to protect against normal oxidative compounds that get generated by mitochondrial activity. FAD is a cofactor in glutathione reductase, okay? That word, reductase is we're reducing oxidized glutathione. We're taking oxidized glutathione that's in, an, that's in an unstable form chemically and we're reducing it back to its active form. And the reduction or the, re, uh, the reducing means that there are electrons being donated to it to help stabilize the chemical as far as it's elect, uh, the, the compound as far as it's electrical charge. FAD is required to convert tryptophan to niacin. And this is another area to kind of look into biochemically, but let's just do a recap here real quick. So think of just the things that we've talked about. It aids in the conversion of converting acetaldehyde, a toxic byproduct of candida yeast to acetic acid. And we know that aldehydes by their chemical nature and acetaldehyde can have toxic effects <clears throat> throughout the body. It's needed to convert pyridoxic acid to the active form of B6. It's needed to act as a cofactor in different enzymatic conversions of glucose metabolism, Krebs cycle metabolism, and the metabolism of certain amino acids down to the Krebs cycle level. It's needed for fatty acid oxidation for the same purposes. It's needed in the conversion of, well, let's call it less active forms of, of folate to the active form that is necessary to engage the methionine synthase to convert homocysteine to methionine. It's needed for the conversion of oxidized glutathione back to reduced active functional form of glutathione. And then it's needed for 
the conversion of tryptophan into niacin. Now, niacin, uh, a niacin deficiency is called pellagra. And it's often termed with the, what's called the four Ds of pellagra. And these are very serious uh, disorders linked to this, but dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, death. Now, riboflavin deficiency, another name for it is pellagra without pellagra, uh, because people can end up developing similar looking um, stomatitis type issues in the mouth and inside the mouth that look very similar, but they're typically not getting the other rashes throughout the body that are affecting the feet, affecting the hands, for example. So from an oral standpoint, it, it looks very similar to a riboflavin deficiency. A distinguishing feature is these rashes and dermatitis effects throughout and other places of the body. So what is the organic acid test? <clears throat> well, as you can see, it is a profile of multiple tests that can give insight into different types of deficiencies and different types of metabolic toxicities. It ultimately requires some dedication to, to learn things at a deeper level. That doesn't mean that you couldn't start in, you know, uh, with a, just a basic fundamental level. And that's really where everybody starts. That's where I started many, many years ago. When I first learned about the or organic acid test, I was kind of clueless about it. It was overwhelming. It, it is all of this chemistry and all of these strange names. So it takes a while to grasp, grasp of this information. So you have to be patient with yourself. And you know, from an, even a, a basic fundamental level, doing this test, you can still help a lot of people, okay? Just by focusing on some of the more common markers that show up with regards to yeast or bacteria or oxalates, I mean, you can help a lot of people that way. And there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If you have an interest to go deeper, this test will allow for that, okay? To take things down to even a deeper level. So again, it's like a layer of an onion. You can keep digging and digging and digging, which is where I've gone with my knowledge. And I'm still digging into much of what this particular test provides. It's not the only test I do in my practice but it is always part of what I do when I am doing a workup on any individual with any kind of health condition. It's not a test that's just specific for a particular group of people because I want to get an idea of underlying biochemical imbalances. And yes, it does send me back to the textbooks. It's, it sent me back to even learning aspects of basic uh, general chemistry and biochemistry. It sent me into the textbooks regarding different genetic disorders. Some of the information is challenging. It's not always easy to remember, but the more you keep at it, the more you keep digging, the more you keep seeing the relationships, the more that this test starts to reveal. And these deeper layers of the onion start to emerge. And so you could think of the oat as again, a gateway into a very deep fundamental aspect of functional medicine. Um, that if you like to research things, if you like to learn things at a deeper level, then there's no better test to start to learn how to work with than the organic acid test, in my opinion. So let's take it back. Let's take it back to just the fundamental concept of functional medicine, right? Understanding the function, the way things are supposed to function and what perhaps has gone wrong in a particular person's body that has led to these issues of what they're coming to see us for, you know? I've got depression, I've got irritable bowel, I've got digestive problems, I've got allergies, I've got fatigue, okay? Again, it's not just, you know, here, take these supplements or here, change your diet. Yeah, that might help for some people on, on and that's important from a lifestyle standpoint and overall health approach standpoint. But many times it requires us as practitioners to, to dig deeper, 
to turn more things over to try to find additional answers. And I'm just going to leave you with this. This is one of the things that I take very seriously in the teaching programs that I have. And that is, is we always as practitioners have to think critically and always think clinically. We're not treating a test. We're not looking at an organic acid test and saying, oh, it's got 25 elevator markers. Let me give this person 25 supplements. We're thinking about what can cause the marker to be high. What are some other things on the oat test that might be contributing to an imbalance and how, what is it doing or how is it relating to the person that's in front of me that this test is coming from? So again, think critically, think clinically is, is uh, something I try to convey a lot. And I always think of it myself in, in my consults. If you are interested in this type of information, we have a lot of courses through Integrated Medicine Academy. In fact, we actually have a lot of free webinars that we do um, that are already recorded off the Integrated Medicine Academy website. And then we have a number of different courses from SIBO to toxicity to autism to the incorporation of the organic acids test. The advanced OAT course is very in depth. Um, I highly recommend people go through some basic organic acid test training, or if you've been using the OAT test for a while, before you jump into the advanced OAT course. More information can be learned about these courses from their respective websites. We do have a course on toxicity coming up. And in the vast majority of courses we have, including this toxicity course, I will discuss some aspects of organic acid testing. And that will come up in this toxicity course. They'll, we'll talk about certain markers on the organic acid test that can be related to things you'll see on the oat. This course also goes into mold and mycotoxins, environmental chemicals, heavy metals, detoxification uh, strategy, sauna therapy, et cetera. So if you're interested in this topic, check out toxicitymasterycourse.com. There still is an early bird special pricing available for this course coming up. We have our own functional medicine course. So if you are new to functional medicine and you want to get into this work more in depth, um, check out our website, functionalmedicinemasterycourse.com. This is a very in-depth course that will give you a good overview of functional medicine um, from how to think about things, lab testing suggestions, and how to think about things from a clinical standpoint with regards to this concept. And then if you are a healthcare practitioner and you want to interact with myself, as well as my partner, Dr. Trenkatella, for lab reviews, for case analysis, for troubleshooting scenarios, you can do that through a Functional Medicine Clinical Round site. This is actually a membership site that allows for one-on-one -on -one consults with us, but there's also a lot of educational material. We have a whole library of material that is constantly building Plus we have monthly webinars and clinical rounds through this website as well. And then we've got a really cool section for something called clinical rounds data sheets. These are one page downloadable PDF documents of different lab tests that will help profile a certain marker or group of markers and what those markers mean and what are some clinical pearls behind that information. So all of that can be access through functionalmedicineclinicalrounds.com. If you are looking to acquire lab tests, there's a website called Lab Test Plus. This provides access to many of the labs through Great Plains uh, Laboratory. And when labs are ordered through here, they actually come with a written interpretation of the relevant findings on those tests. So organic acid test, for example, is available through Lab Test Plus. And then if you have any questions about our Integrated Medicine Academy, our courses, signups, you can go, uh, you can email to integrativemedicineacademy at gmail.com. All of the courses are listed off of the Integrated Medicine Academy website because each course has its own website as well. So 
the Integrated Medicine Academy is really the hub of the wheel, essentially, that you can access information about each of the courses there or go to the in, their individual websites. And if you're interested in consulting with me directly, I'm available through my private practice. The email is scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. My sunrise center.com is the, is the website. Okay, everybody, I appreciate it. I hope you found that interesting. Um, I try and present information that I think maybe pushes the envelope a little bit as far as some of, some of the information um, on where things go from a, a physical, metabolic, biochemical level. At least it's interesting to me. We could talk for days and days, weeks and weeks about the organic acid test and how it can apply in different types of clinical situations. So in the future, I'll come back with even more information, but I talk about that a lot, obviously through the GPL Academy, through our own courses, but there's a lot of information on oat testing and other things from a functional medicine laboratory standpoint on some of the other website resources we have too, as well. Thanks so much. I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler. Take care.